Hey guys, and welcome back to Z3Cubing. Today I'm going to show you how to calculate the number of possible positions on the Rubik's Cube. So if you've been into Rubik's Cubes for any reasonable length of time, you've probably come across this number before. It's commonly called 43 quintillion, and basically it represents the number of possible positions of the Rubik's Cube, so the number of positions that you can create by turning the sides. This, of course, is the most famous position, the solved one. You also have this one, or this one, or this one. Any single scramble that you can do on a Rubik's Cube, that is accounted for in this incredibly huge number. Now most people know of this number, but most of them don't know how to get to this number. Like if you were to just look at the individual pieces on the cube, you count out that there's six centers, there's eight corners, and there's 12 of these edge pieces. How would you get from those numbers to be able to calculate this number of positions? That's basically what I'm gonna be walking you guys through today. It only really takes some very basic math to calculate this number, so even if you're not very advanced in the subject, you should still be able to understand most of this video. Now to begin, we're going to be taking the cube apart because you're actually gonna to need to know the basics of what kind of pieces there are inside of a Rubik's Cube in order to calculate this number. So as I was alluding to earlier, there are three different types of pieces. There are these center pieces right here, which are actually all kind of connected to each other in this core right here. And these center pieces actually do not matter for our calculations at all. You can think of these centers as kind of a reference frame from which all the rest of the pieces are attached onto the cube. Because all these six centers are attached right in the middle of the cube, like this, you can never actually take them apart, you can never actually separate them. Just turning it isn't gonna do anything to the number of positions on the cube. And of course, you can never actually physically swap two colors around. So this has no actual impact on the number of total permutations. Now you have two other different types of pieces inside the cube, which are all held together by the core. You have 12 of these edge pieces, which each have two color stickers on them. And you have eight of these corner pieces, which each have three color stickers on them. And then we have the core, but again, that's not important for our calculation because it's more of a reference frame from which you can attach these pieces onto. So to start off our calculations, we're first going to be working with the edge pieces. Don't worry, we'll get back to the corner soon. Anyway, you can think of these 12 edge pieces each as their own kind of individual unit. It doesn't really matter that they have two different color stickers on them. Just think of this as one edge, this as another edge, and this as another edge. So of course, if you look at the core of the cube, there's 12 different spots that the edges can go on the cube. And of course, there's 12 edges to fill those spots. So to get a better understanding of the total number of ways we can arrange these 12 edge pieces, I'm first going to start off with a more basic example using only three edges. And by the way, at this point in time, we're not going to be worrying at all about the orientation of these edge pieces. So whether it's yellow and green like this, or green and yellow like this, we're not going to be worrying about that at all. We're actually going to be dealing with that later. So we're going to start off with these three edge pieces. And instead of working with them on the core of the cube, we're going to work in little boxes. So these are the three possible spaces that these edge pieces can be in. So this is one possible arrangement like this. And the question that we're asking is how many different possible arrangements of these three edge pieces can we get? So if you start off by just kind of messing around, swapping around edge pieces like this, just trying to count out how many different arrangements you can find, you'll find that there are quite a few different arrangements, but we don't want just an estimate like that. We want to figure out exactly how many arrangements there are of these three pieces so that eventually we can apply that to all 12 pieces. So what we actually want to do is start with no edge pieces, and then we'll work through box by box to figure out how many options we have for each of them, and then we'll use that to find the total number of arrangements. And so we have three edges to start off with for this first box. So how many different edges can we put in this first box? Well, of course, we have three of them. So we'll write three at the top here. Let's just choose this one. Now, moving on to the second box. How many different edges can we put in this box? Well, of course, we have two. If we put two above this one, we'll choose maybe this one. And now for the last box, of course, we only have one option. So now we have one right here. So now to figure out the total number of arrangements, we just have to multiply these three numbers together. Because for each of these three options that we had in the first one, there's always going to be an additional two options at the second one, and of course an additional one option at the last one. So we multiply everything together, and the answer of course is six. Six different arrangements for these three edge pieces. Now we can actually expand this outwards with another edge piece, so if we have four, then we can add another box over here. And then for our first box over here, we have four different options, so maybe we'll choose this one. We put a four there. Now for this next box, we have three options still. Next box, we have two options. In the next box, we just have one option. So now we add the four times three times two times one, and our answer is now 24 different arrangements. So you can imagine if we expand this out to all 12 different edges, we're going to have 12 times 11 times 10 times nine, all the way down to one. Now, obviously, we don't want to write out all of these numbers every single time we want to do this calculation. So there's actually a much simpler mathematical piece of notation to represent this sequence. So if you want to do 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to some number, like 12, you can just write it using the biggest number 
and then put an exclamation mark at the end. So this is actually pronounced 12 factorial, and basically it's a way to represent, of course, that sequence, which represents the number of permutations of 12 objects. So yeah, basically this number right here, 12 factorial written as 12 exclamation mark, will give you the total number of different arrangements of these 12 edge pieces on the cube right here, because of course there's 12 slots that you can put edges on the cube, and there's 12 edges to go into those slots. Now luckily enough, we can actually do this exact same type of calculations, but with the corners. So if we do the same example with four corners, of course we have four possible corners that can go into the first slot, three that can go into the second slot, two into this one, and then one into this one. That'll of course give us 24 combinations, and we can expand that out to all eight corners like this. So of course that's eight times seven times six, all the way down until you get to one, which again can be written as eight exclamation mark or eight factorial. Now if you want to figure out the total number of arrangements of edges and corners combined, all you have to do is multiply these two numbers together. So you have 12 factorial possible different arrangements of edges, and for each of those 12 factorial different arrangements of edges, we also have those 8 factorial different arrangements of corners. So you actually have to multiply these together because for each one of these, there is one of these. So you multiply those together, and we start off our calculation with 12 factorial times 8 factorial. Unfortunately though, we still have some more work to go through. If you remember back to what I was talking about earlier with the edge pieces, all that we've calculated so far is the different number of possible positions that an edge piece can go into. So it can go into this position, or it can go into this position, or it can go into any of those other 12 positions. However, we have not yet taken into account the number of ways each edge piece individually can be flipped around. This is known as the edge piece's orientation. So this is one orientation, and this is another orientation. For this calculation, again, we're going to be starting with just the edges. And for each edge, you of course have two different possible orientations that the edge can be in. One of them in this case is solved, and one of them in this case is unsolved. And you have the same thing for each edge on the cube. So you could have another edge right here, this one's solved, and this one is unsolved. So each edge piece has two possible orientations, and there are of course 12 total edge pieces on the cube. So once again, we're going to think about this problem without using the actual core of the cube. We're going to draw out some boxes like we had before. So we have three boxes, each of these holds its own individual edge piece. We already know where all these edge pieces are located relative to each other. That was included in our previous calculation. Now we just want to know how many different combinations of different ways you can flip the edge pieces there are. So of course, each edge piece has two different possible ways you can flip it. So this one has two different ways. There's one, and there's two. So we can write two up here. This one, it has one, and it has two different ways that you can flip it. So there's two. This one also has two. So there's two, and all you have to do is multiply all those twos together, and that gives us eight, the total number of combinations of flips that you can have on these three edge pieces. In other words, it's the total number of unique positions that you can get to by arranging these three edge pieces only by flipping them in different ways like this. So of course you can expand that out into all 12 edge pieces like this. All you have to do is two times two times two all the way 12 times, and that will give you a really big number, but you can write that as two, to the 12. If you're familiar with exponents, you'll know that if you want to multiply the number 2 by itself 12 times, you just write it like this, 2 to the 12. So if we arrange these out all into a line like this, the number 12 factorial that we calculated earlier is the total number of different ways that we can permute these edge pieces around like this and put them in different positions, whereas this number 2 to the 12 right here is the total different number of ways that we can flip edge pieces around. So this edge piece can be flipped in this way, this edge piece can be flipped in this way. And so eventually we're also going to be multiplying this number, 2 to the 12, onto our ongoing calculation that we did earlier, because for each of those permutations that we calculated earlier, there's also this many combinations of orientations of these different edge pieces that we can have. Now we can do the exact same thing for corners. So if we take three corner pieces here and put them in our three boxes, we want to figure out how many total combinations of orientations there are. How many different unique positions of different ways to rotate and flip them around like this without actually switching the boxes that they're in. Now of course, since there are three different colors on each corner piece like this, instead of having two, like we had an edge piece, we have three for each corner piece. So change that into three. And so that means for these three corners, each of which having three unique orientations that it can be in, we take three times three times three, which of course is 27. So we can now expand that out once again to all eight of our corners. So of course, each of these eight corners has three possible ways that it can be flipped, along with, of course, having different arrangements, which we accounted for earlier. So they each have three ways that we can flip them. So that's three times three times three, on and on and on, eight times. You can simplify that down using exponents to just three to the eighth. Now before we just go ahead and multiply these numbers on to our overall calculation up here, there is a little bit of a problem with these two values that we do have to address. But to explain that, I'm going to have to mostly reassemble this cube. 
Now the problem actually comes about when we have just two pieces left to put into the cube, one edge and one corner. The thing is up to this point we've just been assuming that it doesn't matter which way we put in each of these pieces. The orientation doesn't matter at all, we could have it in this orientation, this one, or this one. We've just been doing whatever and accounting for all of them. We multiply 3 by 3 by 3 eight times because each of these eight corners it doesn't matter what orientation it's in. But once we get to the last corner, it actually does matter what orientation it's in. In this orientation the cube is perfectly fine, you'll be able to solve it and everything. But if you put the last corner in in this orientation and put the cube back together, if you've ever played around with a cube in this particular position, you'll realize that this is not a possible state that the cube can get into just by turning the cube like this. Yes, it is possible to get into it by taking the cube apart and twisting the corner like this, but we're not worried about the number of different ways you can take it apart and put it back together in. We're actually worried about the number of possible positions that you can get to only by turning the cube. So if you imagine you're assembling a cube and you want to get to a state that's actually possible, you do have free choice over the orientation of all of these corners, up until the very last one. This one you can choose whatever you want, but once you get to this very last one, this one is kind of predetermined in a way, because if you do it in the wrong way, if you do it like this, then that's not going to be solvable. So you kind of only have free choice over those first seven, and then the eighth one, you don't have any choice at all. So instead of having three to the eighth down here, we actually just have three to the seventh. That's all we have to do to this calculation to make it correct. Now, of course, the same principle also applies to your edges. You have free choice over what you want to do with all of your first 11 edge pieces. You can put it like this, or you can put it the correct way around like this. But once you get to the 12th edge piece, there's only one possible way to put it in, like this. If you were to put it in like this, the cube would then become unsolvable, and you'll know that if you've messed around with taking pieces out of a cube. Again, it doesn't matter if all the pieces are necessarily in the correct position. You could have one edge flipped around like this, and the other edge like this, but this is still your only choice of positions for the cube to still remain solvable. If you were to put it in like this, then the cube would be unsolvable. So there is no choice for that last edge piece. So thus we have to change this from 12 to 11. So now that we got that little problem worked out, we can now multiply on these two numbers onto our final calculated value up here. So we have times 2 to the 11 for the orientation of our edges, and times 3 to the 7 for the orientation of our corners. Now this number is almost very nearly done, it's almost equal to 43 quintillion, but we still have one little problem that's very similar to that corner twisting problem we were just talking about earlier. Now this final problem is very similar to the problem that we were just talking about, where you have the last edge or the last corner that's oriented incorrectly, and that causes the whole cube to become unsolvable. This is now a state that you cannot normally get to on a Rubik's Cube. Now this problem doesn't have to do with orientation, but it actually has to do with permutation, the stuff we were dealing with earlier. So if instead you switch around two corners like this, you now also have a state that's unsolvable, even if all the orientations are correct. You cannot solve this case on a cube. You can't swap around just two corners. Now, even though it isn't possible to get a cube into this position without taking it apart, it is still obviously possible to have a cube in this position. I just did it by just taking out these two corner pieces and putting them in the wrong way. And at this point, every single move that we do on the cube, we will still have an impossible position to get to. So we still have 43 quintillion different possible combinations of this cube. They're just an entirely different set of positions as the ones where the cube is assembled correctly. We're not worried about those positions at all. We're only worried about the 43 quintillion positions where the cube is actually solvable. Now, if you've messed around with taking pieces out of your three by threes before, you may also know that swapping around two edge pieces like this is also not a possible state to get into. However, this doesn't really matter because having two edge pieces swapped is actually the same thing as having two corner pieces swapped. I'll show you right here. You can actually get from having two edge pieces swapped to having two corner pieces swapped. So it doesn't actually matter whether you swap two edges or two corners, it just matters that your cube is not solvable because you've swapped two pieces. So the thing is, there's only two of these different kind of realms of positions that your cube can be in. The one where it's unsolvable, and the one where it is solvable. The one where it's unsolvable, there are 43 quintillion of those, and the one where it is solvable, there's also 43 quintillion of those. And that's the 43 quintillion that we're worried about. However, our number right here is actually accounting for both of those 43 quintillions. So all we have to do, draw a big line under it, and divide by 2. So that's it! Now that we're only working inside of this kind of realm of possible positions that a real correct Rubik's Cube can be in, we now have the final number which should equal 43 quintillion. To check that, we can get out our calculator, and what we can do is start off with 12 factorial. There is actually a factorial button on a calculator. In this type, you go to math, and you go over to probability, and down to factorial right there, you have a little exclamation mark, multiply that by 8 factorial, do that again, multiply that by 2 raised to the 11th power, just like that, multiply that again by 3 raised to the 7th power, and then divide everything by 2. There is the expression we have written on the table here, press enter, we have 4.3 times 10 to the 19th, which is of course 43 quintillion, or 4 followed by 19 zeros.
So that is it. That is how you calculate 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 3 trillion, 274 billion, 489 million, 856,000, or the number of permutations on a standard Rubik's Cube. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I especially hope you guys learned something from this video. If you're confused about anything, be sure and leave a comment down below, because I can probably explain it a little bit better in text than I can on this video, if there's any part in particular that's confusing you. You guys may remember having watched an old video that I previously uploaded about this exact same topic, but that video is nearly four years old now. It's very bad quality, and I figured I could remake it and explain it a whole lot better. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one compared to that old one, but I will link it down in the description below. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video, and I'll see you guys next time.